Right, good afternoon, Matrix. Uh, I'm Mr. Beckman, I'm a teacher at Port Richards Technical High School, and this afternoon I'm going to be trying to assist you with Chapter 7 in our Matrix Automotive Syllabus. Chapter 7 is on Systems and Control, which is on page 112, but today I'll be trying to do the automatic gearbox and the torque converter and explain each step of the way how it works. All right. So, without further ado, let's get going. Automatic gearbox. What are the two main differences between an automatic gearbox and a manual gearbox? There is no clutch pedal in an automatic transmission, which means you don't have to change the clutch to change gears. It changes the gears on its own. There is no need to change gears in an automatic transmission car. Once you put the transmission into drive, the shifting of gears happens automatically. So lack of that, huh? Alright, automatic gearbox. Purpose. The purpose of the automatic gearbox is to relieve the driver of clutch and gear shift operations, thereby allowing the driver to concentrate on driving the vehicle. Smoother and easier driving of the vehicle is promoted. Advantages, it reduces driver fatigue. How does it do that? Well, you're not having to change gears, you don't have to trap the clutch, all that you have to do is press the uh, accelerator and the car goes and when you need to slow down, you just trap the brake pedal and obviously turn the steering where you need to guide the car. It ensures greater reduction of wheel spin under bad road conditions, e.g. on ice, snow, mud and sand. The vehicle can be stopped suddenly without the engine stalling. The system dampens all engine torsional vibration. Okay, the automatic uh, gearbox and disadvantages is more expensive to manufacture. If a car with automatic transmission has to be towed for long distance, the propeller shaft, which we know as a prop shaft, must be removed. Here is the basic construction of the automatic transmission. You'll see from the left side, that's the output shaft that side. On the right side, it is the basically the torque converter, and then the oil pump. Right at the bottom is your oil sump, with the oil filter inside there, and your valve body. And in the middle, you have your different double epicyclic gear systems, with clutch systems to actuate them, and so forth. All right. Automatic gearbox overview of a basic automatic gearbox components. The torque converter to transmit the power from the engine to the transmission. Okay, so a torque converter is used, used along there. One or more epicyclic gear system to provide the necessary forward and reverse gear ratios. A series of brake bands and multi disc clutches designed to control the epicyclic gear system. Hydraulic pistons to actuate the bands and clutches. One or more oil pumps to provide the necessary hydraulic pressure. The valve body in which uh, check valves and pressure regulators to balance the shift mechanism are housed to control the gear changing. Some means of cooling the oil, okay, so the oil gets very hot because of the oil being whipped around inside the gearbox. And it's a special type of oil that you're going to use. It is normally called ATF, which is what is basically the automatic transmission fluid. Okay, normally it's red in color. It can be different colors. I've seen a green one before, but normally it's a red color or pinky color to it. Okay. Manual control system, which is used to select a certain speed range. Okay, before we go into that, I'm just going to point out some of the items. Okay, so this is our torque converter. Alright, it has got three components to it. Blue section here is my uh, impeller. The yellow section is the turbine, and the red section is the stator. And I'll explain to you just now how that works. On the inside of the gearbox, this is the actual housing here of the gearbox. It actually houses those parts, okay, the clutches and um, you know, the clutches and the um, 
beside the gear tray inside here. This is my pump. You can actually see there's two holes here. With this is the pump section here. All right. So the torque converter, this part here fits inside here and actually drives um, the shaft here. All right. So, you, so the actual driven member, which is my um, turbine, is actually attached to the middle shaft, the, the inside shaft. Okay. The turns, the gearbox. All right. So you've got a number of different brake bands, and then you've got a, a over here, you've got your epicyclic gear train. Alright, just to in short, to show you what an epicyclic gear train is, it's three different pieces. Okay, the front, the middle piece is called my sun gear. Alright, just like the planets of the earth, you've got the sun and the planetary gears rotate around the sun. So the sun gear fits in the middle, all right, and the planetary gears rotate around the sun. Okay, so then the piece that actually holds the planetary gears is called the planet carrier. So this is the piece that is clear. And then you've got an annulus around the outside of that again. Okay, on the outside of the annulus, okay, so this would be an annulus over here, that would be an analyst over there. You have got what is called a brake band. And the brake band goes around the analyst to actually stop it and lock it to different speed ratios. Okay? But then you've also got a valve body right at the bottom of the gearbox. It actually fits at the bottom of the housing. So here's my housing. The uh, valve body sits right in the, at the bottom of it. Below that again is the oil sump, where it actually contains oil inside the, where the pump. Sucks the oil up from the sump, okay, to the different moving parts. Inside my valve body, there are little actuators, okay, little pistons. You can actually see some of them lying inside these little areas here. I think there's a loose one over here. I can show you. Okay, they're actually called a spool valve. There they are there. That's one of them. Okay, so there are a number of these little valves, and as they would move, they would open and close various passages to allow oil pressure at different speeds to either activate the brake band or the clutches inside the actual gear system. And therefore, then the vehicle can move forward and either faster or slower or whatever you're doing. Back to the nose. Just have a look here. Alright, torque converter function. Alright, very important this year. The function of the torque converter is to multiply engine torque automatically according to the road and engine speeds. The torque converter principle. The torque converter couples the engine to the transmission. So basically, we a normal a car with a clutch. The clutch is what actually couples the gearbox and the engine together. But on an automatic car, the torque converter what is that actually couples the clutch to the gearbox. All right. Um, uh, the torque converter uh, couples the engine to the transmission. Its principle of operation can be demonstrated by using two electric fans. Two fans are placed opposite each other. One of the fans, um, power cord is connected to the AC supply, so you basically plug the one fan into the electric socket. The air flows uh, created by this fan causes the second fan to rotate, even though it is not connected to supply. So you basically put these two fans opposite each other, the one you plug in and put it on, and the other one is not on, the power cord is out, it's not even electricity, and that one will start turning. Okay, so basically that is the principle that how a torque converter work, works, except that you're using an oil, not air, to push from one blade to another. So you're actually using oil to be transferred from one from the actual uh, pump, okay, or impeller to the actual turbine. All right, a torque converter uses oil instead of air to perform the turning motion. All right. So we re-established that. Lock up torque converters. At higher engine speeds, the transmission is moving at 
and nearly the same speed as the engine. In an ideal situation, they should be traveling at the same speed because speed differences, uh, there can be some slippage, equal power loss. Some manufacturers overcome this problem by using a lock up uh, torque converter. A typical converter contains a clutch, friction discs, and pads. Lock up clutch apl uh, applied. The activation or deactivation of the lock up clutch is made by oil pressure. When the turbine and impeller are up to speed, in other words, up to the same speed, the fluid is channeled to the clutch piston. The pressure is guided to the back side of the friction plate where it will be pressed against the impeller, thereby connecting to the turbine. Because they are connected, the turbine and impeller begin to turn as one unit. This system improves efficiency and prevents slippage. Okay, lock-up torque converters, lock-up clutch release, when the oil pressure is supplied between the friction plates and the impeller, and the friction plate is pushed backwards. The lock-up clutch is then released, when the turbine and the impeller are up to speed, the fluid is channeled to the clutch piston. This action of pist pu uh, piston pushes the fi fri friction disc pads to together, locking the turbine and impeller to turn as one. The system improves efficiency and prevents slippage. So why is it more efficient? Well, if basically whatever speed the engine is turning, the gearbox will be turning the same speed, and so there's no slippage, and therefore you're not wasting petrol. All right. Lock-up torque converters, there's a nice drawing of it. There you can see on the left-hand side, there is a crankshaft coming from the engine, right in the middle there. And basically, you've got your stator in the middle, okay? That would be this red piece over here, if you can see that. All right. And then the shaft coming out of the turbine, that is going into the gearbox. And so you've got your housing, the pump, another name for the pump that you can see there on the top um, right side of the drawing that is also known as the impeller and that is the driving member and the turbine is the driven member all right and the stator is in the middle that you can see there that changes the direction of the oil flow and basically causes more force to come out of the, as the oil comes back out of the, the stator it causes it to go through the pump section or the impeller and to hit the turbine with greater force and so therefore multiplying torque that's why it's called the torque converter so the torque converter is similar to the fluid flywheel in its con uh, construction except for the following the driving member fixed to the crankshaft has slightly curved vanes it's called the pump or the impeller the driven member supplied to the gearbox main shaft has curved vanes and it's called the turbine the stator is fixed to the gearbox housing by means of the one-way clutch and there's curved vanes. I'm just going to go back to the actual um, example that I've actually got here. Hopefully you can actually see it. That is my torque converter. So this side here on my left hand, this would be attached to the, the crankshaft, and this is my flex plate, okay, with the ring gear on. This side here, if you can see the blue section there, that is my impeller. The yellow one that would be attached to the shaft going through the hole here. Uh, into the gearbox, and that is my driven member for my turbine. The, yellow, the red section here in the middle is the stator. All right. So the stator actually multiplies the oil coming out of the um, turbine before it goes back to the pump. Multiplies the actual uh, the pressure of the oil, if I like to call it that way. So when it comes out of the pump, it comes out with greater force and actually hits the turbine and creates. Uh, more pressure on the turbine to be able to pull the car go faster. Right. Um, so the stator is fixed to the gearbox housing by means of the one-way clutch and its curved vanes. So let's move on. Lock-up uh, lock torque converters applies Newton's law. For example, when a swimmer wishes to make a turn in the swimming pool, he will push uh, with his feet against the wall of the pool to increase the force when uh, which uh, he, uh, sorry, the force with which he wants to get on his way again. In transmission, this means the torque cannot be multiplied unless the fluid is something solid to push on. This something is the stator. So that's the red section there that I showed you in the example. Sorry, let me actually change the screen here. All right. Um, 
Sorry, I'm going to start that again because I didn't change the screen. Apply Newton's laws, for example, when a swimmer wishes to make a turn in the swimming pool, he will push it with his feet against the wall of the pool to increase the force with which he wants to get on his way again. In transmission, this means that the torque cannot be multiplied unless the fluid has something solid to push on. This something is the stator. The stator is mounted between the pump and the turbine and consists of a series of curved blades to redirect the fluid. It is mounted on a stationary shaft that is locked to the transmission housing. The stator is fitted with a one-way clutch and is allowed to spin in the direction of the pump. Any attempt to rotate the stator against pump rotation causes it to lock on the shaft because it's basically got a one-way clutch. Lock up on the torque converter, operation of the torque converter, as the pump begins to spin, or it is thrown outwards in the curved veins of the turbine. Vortex action, okay, that's the oil spinning in basically little circles. The oil circulates around through the turbine veins. The rotor intercepts the oil thrown off the turbine and redirects the path to, of the oil so that it will enter the pump smoother at the same um, time add to the force of the pump. So there you can see the, um, the actual stator actually causing more torque to happen uh, as the oil is redirected and it goes back into the pump side. The torque produced by the redirected oil is increased, which it leaves the pump again to enter the turbine. This torque has multiplied. All right. Oil transfers with the stator. They're showing you a bit of a drawing there of the oil leaving the pump. Well, first of all, actually coming back from the stator into the pump. Okay, so it goes through the pump, the turbine, the stator, back to the pump, and from the pump back to the turbine again. All right. As oil leaves the turbine veins, it strikes the stator veins. As the stator is locked, the veins bend the oil stream to catch the pump at the proper angle. Note there, not, the veins don't bend, but it actually bends the oil stream to catch the pump at the proper angle. It will not now assist the pump as it will enter with some initial velocity. As the torque to, uh, turns faster, it's um, the torque, uh, torque converter faster and faster, it will finally approach the speed of the oil when leaving the pump. When this happens, torque multiplication is no longer possible. So basically, once the actual turbine starts turning the same speed as the pump, uh, the stator is no longer necessary and therefore it just starts turning slowly in the same direction as the pump. Okay, so the converter ceases to be a torque multiplier and becomes a hydraulic fluid coupling which transmits engine, uh, the engine torque to the transmission. The stator no longer takes any reaction but free wheels in the same direction as the pump and the turbine. Stall speed. Maximum torque multiplication is delivered when the pump has reached the highest velocity and the turbine is at stall, basically standing stall. So at this point, you can actually have your car in D for drive and you are not tramping the accelerator or holding the brake and the car should stand uh, stationary and that is called our stall speed. As soon as you touch the accelerator and basically the pump starts turning faster on the torque converter, it's going to cause oil to go across to the turbine and actually start uh, turning the gearbox shaft. Okay, so that's increasing in speed. As the turbine begins to turn, so you've just touched the accelerator a bit, the vehicle starts moving. The speed increases and torque multiplication uh, tapers off gradually. Okay, so obviously once it starts going faster, uh, the torque multiplication will stop. Uh, that's only once the turbine starts turning the same speed as the pump. As cruise speed, as the vehicle speed reaches the cruise speed, the turbine speed approaches that of the pump, the angle of oil dis, um, discharges from the turbine is now such that the oil stream strikes the back of the stator veins, causing it to freewheel, and no torque multiplication takes place. Vortex flow of oil is slow and the um, converter is performing much like a fluid flywheel. This condition is known as a coupling point. 
Right. Infinite gear ratios. The torque converter provides an infinite number of ratios of up to 2 to 1. This provides a smooth flow of power that automatically adjusts to varying load conditions. Advantages. Torque increases automatically. Torque is transferred smoothly and reduces shock to the gearbox, the chassis and the vehicle wheels. So minimum uh, surfacing is required of the system. Now inside the gearbox, and so now that's the torque converter completed, that's basically the section that acts like a clutch between the gearbox and the engine. But now on the actual inside of the gearbox, we have got the, basically the epicyclic gear system. All right. Epicyclic gear system, once again, there's our epicyclic gears with the annulus and the sun gear in the middle and the planetary gears on the outside of the sun gear. All right. And the annulus right on the outside of the planetary gears and the planetary carrier. So if you lock any one of them, you will get a different uh, speed ratio. So let's go and have a look. All right. Back to the main screen. Um, there is either one or more epicyclic gear systems in automatic transmission depending on what load the transmission is designed for and how many forward speeds are required. The gear systems are interconnected. Single epicyclic gear system. All right, that means it's only got one sun gear, um, one annulus, and basically one set of um, uh, planetary gears and a plan carry okay epicyclic gear system is used to obtain different gear ratios between the drive driving and the driven gear members the gear system therefore also provides for variation in torque and direction of rotation construction epicyclic gear system consists of a central gear with external helical teeth which is called the sun gear two or more planet ge um, gears with external helical teeth are arranged around the sun gear Right, uh, so we look back here again. This is my sun planetary uh, gears here. All right, so this one has actually got two sets inside there, and the sun gear will be inside of the slot. All right, then if you pull it apart, there's the sun gear here. All right, and there's my planetary gears over there with some clutch systems inside there. Okay. Um, the planet gears are in constant mesh with the sun gear and they are free to rotate about the own shafts. These shafts are mounted onto a planet carrier and they form a solid unit. An annulus with internal helical teeth fits over the planet gears and is also constant mesh with them. Alright, I'll show you the annulus over here on this gearbox. Here's my annulus with the gears cut in the middle. And so a brake band would go on the outside of the slot here. Alright. Um, these shafts are mounted in a, onto a planet carrier and form a solid unit and the annulus with internal helical teeth with fit over the planet gears is also in constant mesh with them. Let's move on. Single epicyclic gear system. So this is what you can actually achieve, the different uh, gear ratios that you can achieve within operation. To op obtain power flow through the epicyclic gear system, any of the components is kept stationary while any of the remaining two components serve as the driving members. The third member then becomes the driven member. By applicable variation of driving members and stationary components, six different combinations may be obtained. Driving forward, the annulus is locked. Okay, so that's the outside part. Okay, the planet carrier is the driving member with the sun gear as the driven member. Alright, then the next one, overdrive forward again, the sun gear is uh, locked with the planet carrier as a driving member and the annulus as the driven components. Overdrive in reverse, the planet carrier is locked with the annulus as the driving member and the sun gear as the driven component. Reduction forward means you're going slower. Okay, so it's not as fast, that's not overdrive. The annulus is locked with the sun gear as a driving member and the planet carrier as a driven component. Reduction forward, once again also slower gear. The sun gear is locked with the annulus as the driving member and the planet carrier as the driven component. Reduction in re re 
reverse, all right. Uh, the planning carrier is locked with the sun gear as a driving member and the annulus as the driven component. Single epicyclic gear systems operational when any two components of the gear system are locked, the gear system become a solid unit. So if you lock any two of the units, all right, then the whole unit will turn as one, and so then it will be a one-to-one -one ratio. So the gear system becomes a solid unit and direct drive is obtained. When none of the components is locked, okay, so if you lock, lock in any of the components of the single epic cycle gear system, then basically it will be neutral, it will not go forward. The gears will turn, but you won't actually have any drive. So when none of the components are locked, and any one of the three components serves it as a driving member, there is no power transmission, so basically neutral. Double epicyclic gear system. Now this is when we actually use two sets of sun gears, two sets of annulus, two sets of um, planetary gears with the two different planetary carriers. Alright, so if you look on the next page quickly, there is a drawing of the double epicyclic gear system. Alright, so you'll see that there's S1 and S2, those are both sun gears. P1 and P2 are also two different sets of planetary gears and then you get A1 and A2, that's the annulus um, of the one and the annulus of the second uh, um, set of uh, planetary gears and around the outside of both of them you've got brake bands okay, so that you can actually apply or be in the release position so let's go back one alright, so this type is used in order to make transmission on passenger so most passenger cars have got double epicyclic gear systems, if not maybe even three, set, three sets in there. It makes use of two epicyclic gear systems interconnected to give various speed ratios at the output shaft. In pre-selected gearboxes, e.g. the Wilson gearbox, three epicyclic gear systems are used. Construction. The system uses two epicyclic gear systems interconnected, as shown in the figure below. The engine when running always drives both sun gears S1 and S2. The annulus A1 is connected to the planet carrier and um, its gears P2. The planet carrier and its gears P1 are connected to the upward main shaft. Brake bands fit over the annulus of A1 and the annulus A2. So there you can actually see um, that you can see the, the gearbox um, be turning S1 and S2, the sun gears, and basically um, P2, okay, planetary uh, carrier 2, uh, they are mounted to annulus A1 if you look there in the drawing. Okay, all right, so let's carry on. Operation double epicyclic gear train, the sun gear S1 and S2 are driven by the engine. If annulus A1 is held stationary by its brake band, Planet carrier P1 and its gears will walk around and you'll say one. Because planet carrier P1 is connected to the upward main shaft, it will turn it and therefore also the rear wheels. As annulus A1 is held stationary, the planet carrier will rotate slowly, therefore a low gear is obtained. So basically low gear will be like first gear. Okay. Now we go to a second gear ratio. Some gears S1 and S2 are driven by the engine. If annulus A2 is held stationary by the brake band, planet carrier P2 and its gears will walk around annulus A2 because planet carrier P2 is connected to the annulus A1. This will also rotate. However, um, both sun gear S1 and S2 rotate at the same speed at the same time and in the first gear set, annulus A1 also rotates. This means that planet carrier P2 will walk around sun gear uh, S1 far faster than before, giving a higher speed ratio. So this basically would be basically second gear. All right. There's our brake band with an actuator. The brake bands are placed around the annulus of each epicyclic uh, set to enable the annulus to come to the station position to change to another ratio. Multi-disc clutches are incorporated to control the planetary or sun gears so that the ratio changes can take place. Alright, so basically there is normally an actuator. I'll just show you one quickly. 
So he has my brake band, okay, and I've got an actuator. Okay, so this actuator here, you've got a plunger, and this plunger would come out with hydraulic pressure, okay, from the gearbox, and basically actuate the actual brake band and apply it and lock up the actuator A1 or A2. Okay, operation of the brake band. The pump forces the fluid through the inner channel past the open valve to the cylinder. The oil pressure forces the plunger and plunger rod to activate the brake band. The brake band holds the drum in a stationary position. When the valve closes, the oil flows through the inner channel, is cut off, and another channel is open to release the pressure on the plunger. Now that is done by the valve body, as I showed you a bit earlier, the valve body with the actual different little plungers inside there or another name for them as I said um, was the little pistons uh, I had a name for them, oh, I actually forgot it plunger and plunger right are forced back by the pressure springs and the drum is then free to rotate hydraulic pistons that's just what I just showed you a moment ago these pistons are so arranged to control the brake bands on the multi-disc clutches which allow the change from one ratio to another these pistons are controlled by oil pressure from the oil pump. Transmission control unit. Now, right in the middle of us talking about the conventional automatic gearbox, we have got a piece here just telling you what the new gearboxes are in town, where they use a ECU, all right, electronic control unit, and they use solenoids. So this gearbox I've shown you here, demonstrated today, and it's on the table, that is a conventional automatic gearbox where it uses the oil pressure, hydraulic uh, pressures to be able to change the gears. Okay, so now let's look at the modern gearbox, automatic gearbox today. Okay, the transmission control unit or TCU is a device that controls modern electronic automatic transmissions. An ACU, all right, generally uses sensors from the vehicle as well as data provided by the electronic control unit, ECU to calculate how and when to change gears in the vehicle for optimum performance, fuel economy and shift quality. Electronic automatic transmissions have been changed, changing in its design from purely hydraulic mechanical control to electronic controls. Today's designs exist from several stages of electronic automatic transmission control development. So all your vehicles that use panel shift, they would be using the modern type of automatic gearbox. Transmission solenoids are a key component of these control units. Advantages, better fuel economy, reduced engine emissions, greater shift uh, system reliability, improved shift fuel, in, uh, improved shift speed, improved vehicle handling. All right. So these vehicles that use the electronic means of changing the automatic gearbox are far quicker in changing gears, right? And so they are fitted to all the modern vehicles from the Audi, Audis, BMWs, Mercedes Benz. They are all fitted in these cars, right? And obviously, even the really, really um, fancy cars like our Ferraris and Porsches and all the rest. Okay. So let's carry on. Oh, pumps. Now, um, in the front of the gearbox, this is the oil pump right in front here. So these two pieces on the actual torque converter drive the oil pump inside here and these pump oil around through the valve body and then to the clutch system and uh, the actuators inside the gearbox. Okay. So let's look what the pump does. The oil pumps are built into the transmission in order to control the brake bands and multi-disc clutches. Sometimes there are two pumps. Pumps in general used are the variable output band type and an internal external gear type pump um, with a pressure relief valve. Okay, valve body. Okay, so the valve body, this assembly is in the nerve system of the transmission. Okay, so basically it fuels uh, the load on the engine uh, or the gearbox from the engine as you actually accelerate hard or not and that causes 
the oil pressures to change the little spool valves that was the word I was looking for earlier inside the valve body. I'll show you the valve body once again. Okay, so this is a valve body which fits at the bottom of the gearbox and it has got different little spool valves in all these little channels opening and closing various channels for the oil to pass through different passages and therefore change the gears. Right. And this is another valve body and you can see it's got a number of different spool valves inside here opening and closing channels. Right. Okay. The assembly, so as I mentioned, the valve body as we know it, this assembly is the nerve system on the transmission and feels the load and torque requirements of the engine and directs the oil pressure to the correct hydraulic piston so that the correct ratio is selected to suit the load and speed. The valves inside the transmission valve body receive pressurized hydraulic fluid from the hydraulic pump to drive clutch and brake actuators for an optimal band servo ratio. The most important of these valves is the manual valve. It is directly connected to the gear stick handle and instructs which passages should allow hydraulic fluid to pass through. Modern automated transmission systems incorporate sensors, which we mentioned earlier, that monitor car speed, throttle, uh, brake pedal position, engine load to control how soft or firm the gear shift must be. The sensors send, send vital data to the onboard engine management computer, known as the ECU, ECU which directs electronically controlled solenoids that redirect hydraulic fluid to the correct clutch pack. Oil cooling. It is vital for the automatic gearbox for the oil to be cooled because it gets very hot in there as the oil has been whipped around and uh, so there's lots of heat with friction and all the rest there and clutch plates and all the rest. Cooling of the oil is essential in automatic transmission. This is made possible by placing special oil cooler alongside the engine, cooling radiator and circulate transmission fluid through it or circulate it through the bottom radiator tank. The heating of the transmission fluid is brought about by fluid friction in the torque converter while driving. Okay, so manual gear shift lever mechanism. So this is what you actually see in the car. When you're going to start driving the car, you have got your stick shift. And uh, this is definitely not the pedal type uh, shift gearbox on the modern cars. This is just our stick shift. So normally the car will be P for parked. So let's read. This mechanism is used to place the transmission in any desired range. It moves the selector lever on the transmission. Range indicator with a sliding arrow shows the operator which range is selected. P position is used for parking. The output shaft is locked mechanically. The vehicle cannot be moved. Starting is possible. So you can start the vehicle in the P position on the gearbox is in P. R position is used for reverse. To, uh, to reverse the car. No starting is possible. So if you, the car is not started and you put it in R for reverse, you will not be able to start the car. You need to put the car either in neutral position or in the park position, which is a better point to put it in, and then start the motor vehicle. The reverse lights are switched on as soon as you put it into R for reverse. N position is used for the vehicle in stationary, which we know is neutral, and creeping of the car should be avoided so without depressing the brake pedal the upward shaft is not locked starting is possible right so normally we motor mechanics work on the car they either put it in p or in neutral depending on what they want to achieve and work on the vehicle d position is used for general driving this is the standard position for driving on all the roads drive ratios first or low gear Operation. The turbine shaft and the primary sun gear shaft are coupled by the front clutch. The planet gear, um, gear carrier is held stationary by the rear brake band. The rear clutch is disengaged and the front brake band is free, leaving the secondary sun gear free. Driving is from the primary sun gear to the primary and secondary planetary gears, which rotate around their own axis to the annulus, which in part of the output shaft. The secondary sun gear is also driven but performs no driving function. Okay, so the low gear, the 
that is first care on our gearboxes. Right. Second or intermediate care on our gearbox operation. Okay, the turbine shaft and primary sun gear shaft are coupled by the front clutch once again. The secondary sun gear is held stationary by the front brake band. The rear clutch is disengaged and the rear brake band is free, leaving the planet uh, gear free. Drive is from the primary sun gear to the primary and secondary planetary gears. The primary planetary gears and secondary planetary gears rotate around their own axis, while the planet gear carry is carried along the second planet gears, which rotate around the second sun gear. The annulus is driven by the second planet gears at a higher speed than in first gear. So you get achieving second gear here, and the vehicle will be able to go slightly faster. Top gear, which is normally a one-to-one -one ratio. So let's see what happens. Operation. The turbine shaft and the primary shaft gear are coupled by the front clutch, while the turbine shaft and the secondary sun gear shaft are coupled by the rear clutch. Both the brake bands are free, consequently nothing is held stationary. The complete gear system is interlocked when both the primary and the secondary sun gears are driven and rotates as a unit with the top gear ratio of a one-to-one -one ratio. And that's equivalent to our older cars that have got a five-speed gearbox. Fourth gear is equivalent to top gear in this three-speed gearbox, all right. Drive ratio is reverse, okay. So the turbine shaft and the secondary sun gear shaft are coupled by the rear clutch and the planet ge uh, gear carry is held stationary by the rear brake band. The front clutch is disengaged and the front brake band is free, leaving this primary sun gear free. Drive is from the secondary planetary gear rotating around their own axis to the annulus, which is part of the output shaft. The primary sun gear and the primary planetary gears are also driven, but, uh, but perform no dri uh, driving. Reverse gear is obtained by using uneven number of gears in the gear train, in the forward rot uh, ratios. And, okay, yeah, in the forward ratios, an even number of gears are used. In uh, order to determine the direction of rotation, be in mind that the two gears with external teeth will always rotate in opposite directions. A gear with external teeth and gears with internal teeth will however always rotate in the same direction. Okay, there's your activity one. State the functions of the automatic gearbox, which you can go and look right at the start of this chapter. And the four advantages of the automatic gearbox. Release driver fatigue and so forth. You can have a look there. Uh, name two disadvantages of automatic gearbox. Okay, there's some slippage that occurs and it can be slightly heavier on fuel. Okay, so the function of the torque converter, what does it do? It basically it acts as a hydraulic clutch between the engine and the gearbox as a coupling. Name three components of the torque converter. In each case, name the components of the engine on the gearbox to which it is joined. What is the function of the brake pads in the automatic gearbox? 0 0.6, 0 0.7. Explain the function of the valve body in the automatic gearbox. Remember, it's like the central nervous system. It actually basically is what causes the gears to change okay, as the pressures change in the gearbox. Explain the operation of the double epicyclic gear train in low gear. Explain the operation of the double epicyclic gear train in top gear. And those are very possible exam questions, guys. Any of these um, questions here in this activity are very possible exam questions. Okay, now in June or whenever the exams do happen because of lockdown, lockdown or otherwise November or December whenever we write the final exams. What kind of oil is used in automatic transmission? We know it is automatic transmission fluid. Okay, you have two methods of cooling the oil in automatic transmission. You've, you've gone over both of them. Right, when is the radiator fitted below the normal car radiator and or otherwise there's actually a tap in the actual car radiator and it cools the oil. Alright, thank you very much and uh, I hope that was valuable and I hope that you could actually learn something from it and uh, take something from it. And so the tricks are sign off for the next time. We will carry on with chapter seven on your alignment. Thank you very much.